it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the world federation neurology youtube channel viewers to a very unique person professor barbara wilson uh, professor wilson qualified as a clinical psychologist uh, in 1977 i believe i was a primary school child at that time the she has a long journey she is uh, currently the chair for all special interest groups uh, that belong to world federation of neuro rehabilitation which is a global body which is an integral part uh, with world federation neurology for global neurological alliance uh, which is a very promising alliance to sort out uh, brain related matters uh, that both uh, barbara and myself are very keen to advocate on Barbara has a very long CV, which I'm not going to read tonight. Otherwise, we would not have time to uh, interview. She founded uh, a beautiful uh, the journal and uh, editing it uh, uh, that uh, I have the fortune, good fortune of uh, running a special issue on COVID-19 and brain in time to come. So the, the, that, that would be coming. Barbara, very warm welcome to you. Thank you. How Thank you. How excited are you to see World Federation Neurology and uh, Movement Disorder Society is advocating for Parkinson's disease, uh, dedicating 2020 World Brain Day for Parkinson's disease? I think it's a wonderful um, enterprise. I'm delighted that your special interest group and the World Federation for Neuro Rehab and Movement Disorders are engaged in this World Brain Damage Day. Um, I wish you every success um, and think you've done doing a wonderful job. Thank you, Barbara. The, we'll, uh, the, we'll change the, the tactics to introduce you to our audience. Uh, tell us about your childhood and uh, what uh, the set the foundation stone for you to be who you are today as a, as a child uh, growing up. Uh, tell us where you were born, your parents, uh, your siblings, uh, and your early childhood days. Well, I was born in, uh, no, I should have been born in London in World War II, but because of the bombings in London, my mother had to leave uh, London to give birth to me. So I was actually born in Kent, in Tunbridge mm -hmm. Wells in Kent. And uh, when I was three weeks old, we ca I came back to London and uh, basically I'm a Londoner, I grew up there. I spent two years during World War II evacuated, first to an unkind woman who I had to be rescued from and then to a kind woman. So I had quite a traumatic childhood. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very rough childhood. It came from a very poor family in South London. Um, um, but I was a clever child and got escaped through education essentially and um, I got married early I had three children and with the same husband now 58 years later we've, we've been married for 58 years congratulations thank you and I and, had the fortune of uh, meeting the, the nice gentleman at a couple of WFNR meetings uh, he's a oh, he's good. delightful gentleman yes Right, well, he's, um, I mean, he's one of the reasons I've succeeded, I think. Um, I, I got into uh, clinical psychology and then neuropsychology late. I was a mature student. I went to university when my third and last child started school when he was five. He's now 54. And um, I succeeded and I think uh, the main messages I want to put across is, first of all, you can come from a disadvantaged childhood and do well. Secondly, you can be a wife and a mother and have a successful career. Um, and thirdly, you need a supportive partner, a, a spouse or a partner of some kind who supports you and helps you with you know, cooking and childcare and things like that. Um, so they're my main messages. Um, I, I fell in love with neuropsychology during my clinical training. But when I first qualified, I worked in, um, with children with severe learning disabilities and severe self-injurious behaviour. Um, I did that for two years, but my heart was always in neuropsychology. 
And when I first got a job in brain injury rehab in 1979, I knew after my first day there that this was what I would do for the rest of my career. And it was brain injury rehab that really um, intrigued me and motivated me and gave me a reason for going to work all the time. And I still am very engaged in brain injury rehabilitation today. The brain is such an amazing organ and uh, the, I'm sure the, the our viewers would, would agree with uh, that. Uh, I'll spend some time asking a couple of questions. Uh, one of the criticism or one of the issue that we hear regularly is uh, gender imbalance uh, in most professions, uh, academia mm -hmm. and uh, clinical life. Uh, and yes. also the disparities uh, in educational opportunities uh, and training opportunities also talked about not only gender, ethnicity, different backgrounds and so on. But you have an illustrious career where you contributed immensely all over the world. Basically, you work with uh, pretty much uh, uh, each country, as I can see from your publications. So how, what, what is your advice uh, on what, what are your comments on these issues? Uh, how can we overcome such problems uh, as, a, as, as a society? I, I do come from a the, the disadvantaged background also. It's, it's yeah. not easy to overcome these barriers, but you, as long as you're passionate and you work hard and yeah. you need to have good mentors and support, uh, and you can you can do a productive journey it helps uh, uh, the, the whole world uh, but i'll let you comment uh, on the points that i raised yes well um personally i've i've not really experienced this um, um gender problem uh, and i think partly it's because my husband's always supported me um, but i know it exists but I've also had very important women role models in my life, in my career. Um, Janet Carr was one of the first people I worked with in learning disability. Uh, she died uh, um, in March this year. She recently died at the age of 93. So she's been a big inspiration to me. I've worked with other women who are very successful and dedicated. Um, so. I've had good role models um, and I've also worked for people where um, they've been very fair about treating women and men and giving them the same um, salaries and so forth. Um, so personally, it's not been such a big deal. Although I think for other women, it, it has been a struggle. And I know in my own field, in neuropsychological rehabilitation, if you look at the people doing a psychology degree, as you have to start doing that, it's nearly all women, the majority are women. But if you look at people in the senior posts, in the manage, senior managerial posts and the ones who succeed, they're typically men and women are always in a minority. Um, I think things are easier now than they were, you know, one of, my, one of my colleagues, for example, Pauline Munro, who's a neurologist and works half the year in Russia and half in the UK, she was the first woman neurologist to work at the Wolfson Rehabilitation Centre. She was the first woman neurologist to be appointed there. And she had to really, really struggle. Um, people resigned because of her appointment. Um, uh, she... Uh, it was very, very hard for her, and I've never had to do that. I've always found it, I don't know, much easier. And um, I always think you, you have to follow your, you have to be passionate and follow what motivates you. I know once I was speaking at um, a meeting by the um, Academy for Medical Sciences, a very prestigious academy, mostly men, Mm -hmm. but some women and they organized a, a one-day meeting called uh, women in the glass ceiling so this glass ceiling is an imaginary ceiling that prevents women from getting to the top jobs mm -hmm. anyway they uh, invited women who'd been very successful to talk about how they'd escaped from this mm -hmm. imaginary glass ceiling and I was one of the invited speakers and at the end we had to give tips to the young women in the audience about how to succeed. And the other speakers said things like, 
you must go to the right laboratory, you must publish in the high impact journals. And I never said anything like that. I said, you have to follow your heart. You mm. mustn't be afraid to fight the system. You have to have somebody to support you throughout. Um, so I was quite different from these other women. I mean, it's never bothered me about going to high impact journals. I do publish a lot, but I'm, I want to, um, I always think, who do I want mostly to hear this message? And it's the people in rehab. It's typically the other psychologists, the occupational therapists, the medical doctors, whoever. Um, they're the ones I want to hear. They're the ones I want to communicate with. And whether it's in a high impact journal or not is much less important to me. Well, I don't know if that answers some of your questions anyway. I, I think it does, sir. The, uh, while you are giving that answer to me, I remembered uh, two anecdotes. I remember reading uh, about uh, the late uh, Charles Miller Fisher, as you know, the great Canadian who went to the US and then discovered Miller Fisher syndrome and whole lot. He once uh, answered the question saying that as he was a prisoner of war for three years, during that period, uh, he learned uh, that there's not much of complaining, but what matters is uh, the getting on with the job at hand and then let that work speak for itself. I remember uh, I wouldn't name uh, where this was uh, as I was trying to get into neurology training uh, in a Western country. A particular neurologist once uh, told me that I was a physician trainee at that time. He told me that he said, you should not do neurology and neurology is for English speaking people. And unless your language is, uh, your mother language is English, it is very hard for you to become a neurologist. Uh, I had to work with this particular person as I was looking for a job in that as my son was just born. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I realized that there had been a lot of great Russian neurologists, uh, French neurologists, uh, Italian neurologists who probably didn't speak English at that time. Again, I didn't let that uh, phrase uh, affect me and uh, he himself taught me a great deal of neurology later on as I entered the neurology training. I just followed mm -hmm. passion and worked hard and made sure that uh, he liked me more than someone else uh, who was applying for the yeah, training job. That's what, that's what I learned from that Miller Fisher. I think you basically epitomized the same thing. Yes, uh, absolutely, yes. World is not a fair world, but we just have to get on with the tasks at hand. And then people would uh, reward you when they realize that you work hard, that you work hard and you deliver. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. I mean, I always say, you can't choose where you're born. You can't choose the color of your skin. You mm. can't choose your, the religion of your parents, but you right. can choose to be a good person. Absolutely. So that's one of the things I try to. Um, and you know, we're uh, in our family, we're big Bob Dylan fans, the singer Bob Dylan. Right. And one of the things Dylan said that always uh, strikes home with me, he said, you have to deal with what life chucks at you. You have to deal with it. And that's true for all of us, wherever we live and work and whatever circumstances we come from. Life happens and you have to get on with it. Oh, absolutely. I like to share another little anecdote uh, with you. I have seen uh, in my own home front, uh, my wife is a good psychiatrist. Uh, I have seen that uh, the, they do this, this great deal of cake making sometimes. Sometimes they have all the ingredients that they need. So they take all the cookery books out and they try to bake the best cake that they can. Some days I see that they have minimum ingredients. Uh, eggs are about to or nearly rotten or the milk expiry date yesterday, uh, the, the, the not enough uh, self-raising flour, but they still bake a cake with the minimum ingredients. I have seen that when they bake the cake with minimum ingredients, uh, they, they bake the most delicious cake. So you're absolutely right. What matters is how, you, how we deal with what we have rather than complaining what we don't have. Mm -hmm. So tell us your days uh, uh, of uh, setting up uh, Oliver Sangville Centre for Neuropsychological Rehabilitation in, at Cambridgeshire. Was it quite challenging? Yes, it was. I think that was one time when I did experience this um, sexism. Um, when I, 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 it started because I'd just been on sabbatical in the USA. You were and, a full professor by that time? No, I wasn't. Um, I'm mostly a clinician, you see. My professorships are typically honorary. Mm -hmm. 
um, I'm, um, and because I worked for the Medical Research Council for 20 years, they don't give professorships. Mm -hmm. um, they have something called senior scientist special status, which mm -hmm. is equivalent to a professor, mm -hmm. but they aren't called professor. Um, and I was a senior scientist with the Me Medical Research Council. Um, and my, I have three honorary professorships now with mm -hmm. University of East Anglia in, mm -hmm. in England, with University of Sydney in mm -hmm. Australia, your new home country, and the one University of, of Hong Kong. Universities. That's one of the most top professorships uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I went to on sabbatical and uh, to George Prigatano's unit in Phoenix, Arizona. And it wasn't George particularly, um, the clinician there that really influenced me is a woman called Pamela Klonoff. And I came back to England thinking this is the kind of rehabilitation I'd want if my nearest and dearest needed it, but I don't want to work in the States for a number of reasons. So I met um, a community health physician, a man, Tony Jewell, and I was telling him about my feelings and he said, put in a business plan to the health authority to try and set up a rehab like that in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that will get nowhere. Mm -hmm. But I did it. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually took three years of negotiations. And I had support. I had support from the Medical Research Council, my employers. I had support from pe some people at Adam Brooks which is mm -hmm. the main teaching hospital in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. But I also had enemies and mm -hmm. I, I attracted some enemies there, particularly mm -hmm. male medic, medical people mm -hmm. who didn't want me to succeed. Mm -hmm. And partly they didn't want me to succeed because I wasn't basing it at Adam Brooks. I was basing it at a, a country hospital 30 miles away where there was more space, more room, easier for people to park and so on. So they didn't like a center of research excellence being established in a small hospital rather than yeah. one of the prestigious, well-accepted hospitals. Yeah. And it wasn't a research center, it was a clinical center. Mm -hmm. Now the Medical Research Council are not allowed to pay for clinical work. So mm -hmm. I did a split uh, post. I had half my week was research and half week was clinical. Mm -hmm. But the center was a clinical center the mm -hmm. Oliver Zangwill Centre. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was one particular man at Adam Brooks, a neurosurgeon, who mm -hmm. was very, very nasty and cruel to me and didn't want me to succeed. Mm -hmm. And he spread, he, he said to me, if you have this centre at Adam Brooks, I will give you 100% support. And if you don't have it at Adam Brooks, I won't support you at all. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's not very patient oriented. You've got to do the best for the patients. Mm -hmm. And I knew if we'd gone to Adenbrook, first of all, there's no space there. But secondly, the medics would have taken it over. And mm -hmm. I wanted it to be a democratic educational service mm -hmm. that wasn't run by a medical person. Mm -hmm. So he, and then when we did open, he spread rumours that we were a private centre and we've never been a private centre. We're a National Health Service centre. Mm -hmm. So that's when I first, I don't know if it was because I was a woman or because I was a psychologist or because I just because I wasn't going to Adam Brooks. But that was one time I did experience some behaviour I disapproved of. But you still like uh, late uh, great Miller Fisher said you got on with the job and uh, you established the centre anyway. Yes. And I did have support as well. It wasn't all negative. You see, they were a split. I had uh, some very supportive people there. And uh, he was particularly negative, this guy. But I think there were others like him as well. They didn't want a rehab centre that wasn't run by a medical person to succeed. I mm -hmm. think that was what the, the main problem was. So tell me about uh, your World Federation and your rehabilitation base and uh, how you established the journal. Let's start with the journal. What was the, what was the beginning of uh, the journal? How did you start this uh, out of scratch uh, from nowhere? How did you convince the publishers that they should uh, dedicate? Well, they asked me. I was at a meeting in, in England, I think, and um, Rohays Perry, who used to run the journals for Psychology Press, which are now part of Routledge, 
Rohes Perry was there and she came up to me at this meeting and she said, would you consider starting a new journal on neuropsychological rehabilitation? I was a bit shocked and I said, well, I would, but I'd want Ian Robertson, who's now in Dublin, but at that time was working in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd want Ian Robertson to come in with me. So um, we started it and at first it was a big struggle to get enough papers, mm -hmm. but now we have papers coming in all the time. Um, I spend part of every single day on the journal. Christmas Day, all the holidays, every day. Um, it's usually delegating, mm -hmm. um, but I have to do something on the journal every day. Anyway, we started up in 1991. I think I was approached in 1990. Mm -hmm. So it took about a year to get going. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been editor in chief ever since it started. And Ian Robertson has been deputy editor ever since it started. And um, some of the all well, the action editors have all changed over the years but um they're still going strong and still very successful and i think um ian and i worked well together because i'm more uh, i'm less critical and open and i think if this is an interesting rehab point i want to publish it whereas ian is more careful and he says oh it's got to have a high citation rate and we've got to um what's the other thing he says um uh, we don't want journals that aren't going to get cited and um, and between us we compromise and we get there I think um, so I quite like working with Ian um, even though I think he's quite different from me but we we've got this compromise going between the more open less critical me and the more critical strict scientific Ian so I think the partnership works one of the, 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 one of the criticisms that I hear when I travel in Southeast Asia uh, during non-pandemic times is uh, generally, this is not targeted at your general, but broadly speaking, one of the common theme uh, that I'm hearing is that most uh, prestigious journals uh, do tend to discriminate against uh, the certain countries and certain factions. Uh, sometimes they get uh, critiqued uh, and uh, asked them to or force them to have uh, co-authors uh, from uh, well-established, well-developed countries. Uh, the, when you look at uh, some of the publications, you can see there is a disparity of representation between countries. Do you, do you, do you buy that argument or do you think... Uh, uh, I try not to. I mean, I'm totally against any kind of racism or discrimination. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, on the journal, on the big boards, the associate editors board, we have people from India, China, Iran. We um, we try to be really international. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems, though, is that if people are submitting from other countries, um, it's their English isn't always, you know, it's not their first language. So, mm -hmm. not surprisingly, mm -hmm. their their papers aren't always written in the best possible style. Um, and we do try to get around that sometimes because um, the publishers do have a service to improve English and sometimes the action editors are prepared to do that. It depends how bad it is to start with. Um, but we certainly try not to discriminate in any way and we try to be fair. And I'll just tell you another story which made me really angry um, to do with Iran. Now, I've been to Iran. Mm -hmm. I got very well treated, although I didn't like the dress code I was forced to adopt, but mm -hmm. the hospitality was very good. Anyway, I edited this big international handbook with three other women, or four of us from different countries, the um, Neuropsychological Rehabilitation, the International Handbook. Mm -hmm. And we had two, uh, two chapters from Iran, one on neuropsychiatric disorders and there was one section called rehabilitation around the world where we had um, India, China, Russia, South America, we had lots of countries and we had Iran. So we had the rehab around the world and the another whole chapter from Iran. Good, went fine, we edited it, changed it, so forth. Book was published. Everybody either got a hard copy or an e-copy except the people from Iran. They weren't allowed to have it because of the sanctions. 
yeah. and I was so so angry you can't ask somebody to contribute to a book and then not give them a copy of the book and I've never ever and I emailed the publishers about this and the publishers said um we feel the same as you but we're not allowed to send them and the only way they can get it is if they go to another country and buy it there or if I get one to another country for them but I can't send one to Iran and you know everybody does bad things Britain does bad things America does bad things Iran does bad things India does bad things Pakistan does they all do it and you can't academically stop collaborating with people because of that I don't think uh, um, and I, I agree I agree in fact I was telling uh, one of the colleagues from Singapore when I was doing a similar interview this morning that uh, one thing that this pandemic has uh, shown to me at least uh, doing this World Brain Day project is uh, one, one thing that I have witnessed is uh, if there are political leaders at this point of time who wanted to divide and conquer the scientific community exactly done the opposite. Uh, if, you, if you search uh, COVID-19 uh, in PubMed, uh, you, you're basically going to see almost close to 30,000 publications from all over the world uh, collaborating and publishing. Uh, and uh, the second thing is uh, you can see how different countries are connecting to each others uh, in an unprecedented way. I read uh, somewhere that the recently concluded European Academy of Neurology annual scientific meeting, usually attended by a few thousand people, this time it is virtual and this time it is free. I read somewhere that it, 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 the, the number of attendees were over 40,000. And there were more than 3,000 participants from Brazil itself, uh, apparently. So I, I felt, uh, so what a fantastic thing. At least uh, the, this virus has made education equal or equal access to educational material globally. Yeah. yeah. And you see, the collaborations we are having now, uh, we're trying to establish, is with um, uh, India, Iran, South America. Italy, the countries where they've got lots of COVID cases, I mean, not that we want them to have lots, but if they've got lots and these people are mm -hmm. going to have neuropsychological problems, we need to collaborate. So it's not the, um, it's not the countries you might think we'd normally collaborate with, it's, it's, it's anybody that's going to have see lots of these COVID-19 patients. Totally, to I totally agree. When you open up most neurology journals, you would see the call for global coalitions and call for global collaborations uh, as uh, everybody uh, the, is aiming to support uh, brain-related matters as best as they can, rightly so. So finally, the other than uh, neuro rehab and outside uh, neuroscience, uh, medicine, uh, neuro rehabilitation, uh, how do you the, the 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 what do you do for Joe? You the, the, what do, what do you do beyond uh, neuro rehabilitation? What well, outside of work? Yes. Oh well, <laughs> up until three months ago, I travelled a lot. I used to be abroad once or twice every month. Right. Um, so I can't travel now. Um, my husband and I are theatre goers, cinema goers. We like to go to restaurants. Um, all of that's had to stop for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very family oriented. We are. A, we have one daughter living nearby, and mm -hmm. she's able to come at the moment in our garden. So we see her. We're going to her garden tomorrow for Father's Day. It's Father's mm -hmm. Day in England tomorrow. Um, we have a great granddaughter who lives not too far away. We've managed to see her twice. Mm -hmm. um, I have. A son in Chile, I have grandchildren in England and grandchildren in Chile, South America, mm -hmm. and every Monday now we do a family Zoom meeting right. with the Chilean right. family and the British family, and we do it a bit like, I don't know if you know the program Desert Island Discs. No, uh, well, on, on the, it's been a very, very long running radio program that everybody in Britain loves called Desert Island Discs, and they have an important person on it who chooses eight imagines he's stuck on a desert island and he or she chooses eight songs and they have to say why they've chosen the song and so on anyway we do a family version where each household sends in a song right. to the 14 year old grandson in chile samuel in spanish or samuel in english uh, they're both bilingual the grandchildren there mm -hmm. and um 
we have to say why we chose the song and why it means so much to us. And we have themes like fathers or funny songs or love songs or travel songs. And then um, we all go round and Sammy decides the order. And when it's our turn, we say, well, we chose this because like, my father sang it to me when I was a little girl or something like that. Um, and so that's our Monday at six o'clock, six o'clock UK time, one o'clock Chilean time. Mm -hmm. We have to make sure the two boys aren't having a lesson then because they're right. doing online work from school. Um, so we're very family oriented. And you probably know my, our oldest daughter died in Peru. Right. In, it's just, we had the 20th anniversary this year and we had her birthday this month. And that was another message. When I was doing this glass ceiling talk, the other message was, you can survive this it's, and lead a meaningful life. At the time, you think you can't, you're gonna die of a broken heart. Mm. But you know, that's when the Bob Dylan, you have to deal with what life chucks at you. And um, quite a lot of what I do now, I do for Sarah, the daughter that died. And I travel for her. And the, all the grandchildren know about her and talk about her. So uh, anyway, I'm going off track now. So what do I do? So they're the kinds of things I do when I'm not working. But I do work a lot. I've been working this morning. And we've got a very, very interesting patient from India. One of my Indian colleagues. You're originally from India, right? Uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Oh, Sri Lanka. Okay. Well, I have been to Sri Lanka too, yes. Um, Lots of Buddhist temples there, I remember. <laughs> but anyway, I have very, very good friends. Two very close countries, India and Sri Lanka. Yeah. But I have very good close colleagues in India. Mm -hmm. And one of them, Jawala Narayanan, uh, lives in Bangalore. And she recently told us about a COVID-19 patient who had a stroke, which isn't that uncommon. But then this patient had Balint syndrome, which is very rare. Mm -hmm. And most Balint's patients have had anoxia, mm. but occasionally they've had a stroke and that's what happened to this woman. So we're busy writing her up at the moment mm. and going to submit it next week to the International Neuropsychological Society. And mm. I think it's the very first COVID-19 patient to be diagnosed with Balint syndrome. Mm. So it came from Juala in Bangalore, but the, uh, I'm writing it with her and Jonathan Evans from Glasgow, the three of us. Are, and that's what I've been doing this morning, tidying up that paper a bit. Excellent. Uh, uh, the, finally, Barbara, the, what is your message? I mean, we, we got the most of the messages that we, we wanted the younger generation to hear. But to summarize, uh, what do you want to tell uh, those girls and boys uh, out there, wherever they are, if they weren't, were, if they were to pursue a particular passion, what is your advice to them? Well, I think you have to follow your heart. You mustn't be afraid to fight for, for what's right. Um, you, you know, we're in it. We're in this for the patients, not for ourselves, not for our own careers, but mm. to make patients' lives and their families' lives better. And I think we have to hold that message always in our minds that we're doing this for them and do something sensible, not some tiny little so what thing like a response time, but make their everyday lives better. Um, so I think if young people can do that, it's a very rewarding, brain injury rehab is a very rewarding career to be in. And I would encourage them to go in it and use their common sense and their creativity and their innovatory skills and work hard for that group of patients. Thank you very much, Barbara. You have an illustrious career and you have penned that into a book. Uh, and I will add uh, the link uh, to that book uh, either to get that as an ebook or a hard copy book for WFN YouTube channel viewers. Uh, despite your busy schedule with a 24 hour notice, uh, thank you very much for accepting my invitation and giving me. Sure. The Pleasure to talk to you and good luck with World Brain Damage Day. Thank you very much. Uh, take care and take things easy. All the very best. Bye then. Bye now. Bye.